Hi, and welcome to part one of our spring 2019 cruise in the stunning Pacific Northwest. It was the last days of April as we packed our bags under the suspicious eye of Emily. There was a skiff of snow in the car as we made our way to the airport and then hopped our flight to YVO. Then we took the short hop over to Nanaimo. We'd already delayed our leaving by about a week and were anxious to get out on the water. Ian from the Nanaimo Yacht Charters picked us up at the airport and we started hauling stuff onto the boat. First up was borrowing the NYCSS courtesy gift and stocking up with what was hopefully a month's worth of groceries. The next morning we topped up the tank, checked in with the office, and incidentally checked out a piece of stained glass that I had made for them. Before we cast off our smuggler crow across the Strait of Georgia. The weather was great, the winds were nice, but since we were still unpacking, both literally and figuratively, we opted to motor across. As we set off, I noticed that the issue with our chart plotter being dim was still a problem, one that unfortunately was going to get worse. We settled into a nearly empty smuggler cove and tried to enjoy the calm quiet of this gorgeous park. Unfortunately, that was not to be. Early that evening, we heard the buzz of a helicopter which got louder and louder. Peeking out of the cockpit, we saw it was settling into the smaller cove south of us. And then another one appeared on the horizon. We could see a bucket dangling from the long line. And as the first helicopter climbed back up, we could see water streaming out of the bucket as he hurried off to the east. And that set the tone for the next couple of hours. The choppers were making about a five minute rotation so the fire couldn't have been too far away. Again and again they would swoop in, lower themselves and their buckets into the cove and then lift off. Slowly at first and then gaining speed momentum as they hurried off to wherever the problem was. Rinse and repeat. It was fascinating watching them and their speed and precision was incredible. I think of about 30 or 40 approaches I only saw them have to go around again twice in order to settle into what was a pretty small cove surrounded by hills and trees. Eventually they were done, and quiet descended on us once again. The next morning it was 11 degrees Celsius. That's 51 degrees Fahrenheit for the old fashioned among us. That's my limit for cold mornings and I decided to fire up the Wobasto, which then made a horrendous noise. So I turned it off and on, tried it again. Same issue. That was it. I wasn't going to put up with a broken heater for the second year in a row. I gave Ian a call, told him we were coming back, and asked if someone could look at it right away. And back across the street we went. A few weeks ago, I'd been following a thread on a cruising forum about sharing the waters with big ships. A lot of people were advocating not getting within one mile of these large ships with poor maneuverability. That just doesn't fly here in the narrow, crowded waters of the Pacific Northwest. Back at the dock, it turned out that the research pump was on its last legs. Technically, I don't need this pump because the heater itself has a smaller one built in, but this makes some of the distances on a boat easier for the heater to handle. Working on boats sure can be awkward sometimes. We got it switched out and the sail restitched in a couple hours, and then headed over to Mark Bay to enjoy the rest of the day and just chill. Since we'd missed my birthday and all the traveling, we decided to head over to the Dingy Dock Pub for a cider and some dinner. And then the next morning it was back across the strait. 
we stopped by the municipal docks to pick up some more booze and then raise the sails and got a good 30 or 40 minutes in until the winds dropped to about two knots. On arrival, we had another adventure, stern tying at Smuggler Cove, and then settled in for a nice dinner. The next three days were just about lazing around. We hiked some of the old trails and some new ones as well, basically reminding ourselves why this is one of our favorite anchorages. We even managed to get some work done. The batteries running low, we decided to head north to our usual stop, Sturt Bay. Since the wind was against us, we opted to motor and recharge the batteries. On the way, we were treated to a small pod of six or seven orcas headed south. But banging into the wind was no fun and we were in no hurry. So we decided to stop in at Ballet Bay which is on the south part of Blind Bay. We'd never visited before, but had had it recommended to us by our old friends on Arshak Island. We arrived at low, low tide and dropped anchor in the center in about 20 feet of water with at least a day's worth of charge back in the battery bank. Arriving at low tide, you can see all the rocky shoals that frame the small bay. But later that evening, they all slowly slip beneath the surface of the water We set off to explore the various little islands and islets and came across this small tidal rapids formed by the incoming water rushing back into the small lagoon. The next day we headed back out into the Malaspina and as per our usual luck of either no wind or a headwind, we were treated to glassy smooth water. We motored up the strait past Powell River and popped into Lund to fuel up and top up with water. And then it was off to the Copelands. We thought about trying a new spot, but in the end opted to try out the shiny new chains that had been installed in the South Bay that we previously visited. We were anchored in about eight feet of water, which is as shallow as we'd ever attempted. That still gave us theoretically three feet under our keel. The next morning we set off to explore and I tried to film the keel and the bottom with limited success. Next up was Major Islet, home to some extraordinarily noisy sea lions. We motored up to the west side of the big islet well away from them, then turned off the engine and slowly drifted past several big bulls and a group of females. At one point we were getting a bit too close to them so I had to unship the oars, which did seem to alarm the loudest of them, but eventually we moved past. I believe these were stellar sea lions. On the other side of the islet, I spotted a sleeping sea lion. I had seen this phenomenon before when traveling down the west coast, but it was new to Leslie. Sea lions can sleep on the sea, unconsciously lifting their heads out of the water to breathe without waking up. I have no idea why he was sleeping off on his lonesome. Afterwards, we went in amongst the Copelands and we cruised the shore looking at sea creatures and generally enjoying ourselves.
The next day was more of a hiking day, and we scrambled to and fro across the sunburned hills and enjoyed the tidal pools and wildflowers. We also saw the most extraordinary display of local knowledge as this Bayliner 38 came rumbling up between two islands and then headed across a shallow passage that I knew would be completely dry in a couple of hours. The next morning, after some quick math, we figured we could eke out one more day on the batteries, so we opted to hold on one more night and set off to explore one of the other anchorages here in the Copelands. It's a bit more open to passing wakes, but has none of the scary rocks or wrecks to negotiate that make our current anchorage so proud. When we got up the next morning, it was up and off on a short 20 minute trip to Lund, just to give the batteries a good charge and see if we could find some produce and a little bit more cider. Lund is a really lovely town and always worth a stop, no matter how short. Well, that pretty much wraps up part one of our trip. Join us for part two, where we spend some time exploring Desolation Sound. <laughs>